Hey everyone, welcome to the 30 Day Speaker Summit. We got an amazing guest, Austin Medlin, all the way in Florida. Well, I'm in, uh, you know, while I'm in cold Canada right now. But uh, if this is one of your first videos for the summit, my name is Daniel Francis. I'm the host. And this is a summit where I'm going to be interviewing multiple guests on this concept of communication and public speaking and really just getting your message across to as many people as possible so you can be the best uh, version of you. Now, what I'm really excited about Austin is he has a, an amazing background and he it's not just theory with him. It's actual um, actual numbers, which, you know, um, you know, people lie. Numbers don't. So let's just let's just kind of get into who Austin is, and then we'll go right into this interview where we're going to be talking about uh, commanding a room, and whether that's on a stage, whether that's in a meeting, whether that's with your sales team, um, and why that's so vital to becoming the best version of you. So let me introduce Austin. Okay, <laughs> um, Austin is an entrepreneur. He's a sales coach and a high ticket closer. So high ticket closer uh, is someone that you know. From what I understand, Austin, we can kind of get into that, but that's anywhere from three to ten thousand dollars a deal. I'm sure up to a hundred thousand dollars, but um, you know that that um, that ability to do that is extremely key, and we'll definitely uh, dive deep into that. So he currently closes one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a month in sales, um, and is a leader to many. Austin also helps coaches and consultants double their prices and close up to ninety percent of their calls without feeling salesy or sleazy. And I know sales kind of has a bad rep. And that's why I'm super excited to kind of like dive into that because there's a level of belief that's really needed there. And, and I'm super excited. So with that being said, we're going to be talking about really how to command a room and why that's so vital to being successful in all aspects of your life. So Austin, welcome to the summit, sir. Daniel, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. That's awesome, man. So let's just, let's just kind of get into it. Um, you know, Austin, one of the, um, one of the first questions that I, you know, I kind of have for you is well, when we say command a room, what comes to your mind? Like, what does that mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And commanding a room is going to be different depending on the room that you're in. Sometimes you want to command a room with sadness or happiness or joy or laughter or ultimate breakthroughs. So commanding a room really means evoking a proper emotional response from your audience, whatever you're looking to gauge from them, whether it's happiness or sadness or laughter. And it really comes down to storytelling. And it comes down to putting emotions that you know is exactly what they need at that time so they can transform in one way or another. And so you can ultimately get your message across. Love that answer. That's that's a that's a, a great answer. And let's kind of like, you know, before we really dive in uh, deep into the details, tell me about Austin. How did he get to this level? Were you someone right out of the womb? You're just, you know, commanding the doctors. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But were you like, how, how were you as a kid? And when did you get to this level? Is this something that is natural for you? Did you build, you know, this muscle over time? Tell us about that. So I actually was terrified of public speaking, never wanted to do it. I, I never wanted to be called on in class. We had certain classes in middle school, high school, where you had to present in front of people and it was literally nerve wracking. I just wanted to shrivel up and cry and never stand in front of my peers, my teachers. I mean, I never wanted to be the center of attention commanding a room, let alone. And that all really changed when I was 18. I got into network marketing and I was like, man, this is a really good skill that I should probably have. And I, I was very interested in it. Um, I never really hired a coach or a speaking coach or a mentor or anything like that. But I'll, I'll never forget, we had a meeting. It was at this kid Aaron's house. I, I will literally never forget this. And there were three prospects who didn't know about the business yet. And they came to hear about it. And there were three business partners. So a total of six people, including me, six people in the room, and I asked one of my uplines in my network marketing company, I said, hey, can I present a little bit about the company? So you do more about the compensation and the, the products and stuff. Give me a five minute bit about the company. And I stood in this tiny little room at this kid Aaron's house with three prospects sitting on a couch with my phone in my hand shaking, like literally with my notes. And I told him, I said, hey, this is my first time ever doing something like this. I'm a little nervous. So bear with me. And it like it made me feel really good that I put myself out there and I did that. 
but it also made me feel kind of insecure. And I'm like, wow, like this is a muscle that I definitely need to work out that mm -hmm. I definitely need to work on and put some time, effort and energy into. So I did that event and then I spoke at another one and another one and another one. And sometimes there were three or four people there. Sometimes there were 30 or 40 people there. And I just got better and better and better over time by just making myself uncomfortable, putting myself out there. It was not the easiest thing in the mm. world to do, but I kept doing it over and over and over. Eventually I got flown out and, and spoke in front of 150 people in Las Vegas at a company event. I wow. spoke in front of 300, 400 people in St. Pete, Florida. Uh, and then I spoke in front of about 750 people in San Diego, all of which I got flown out to, or, you know, trip paid for and got to speak there. Um, I mean, just from homes and stages and office buildings, I, I put myself in front of people as many times as I could, because it was something I genuinely wanted to get better at. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really crazy to think about that. All of that prepared me in the network marketing company to speak to date at the biggest event of my life. And it was actually in front of about 2000 people. And it was, I, I had been dating a girl at the time she was hit and killed by a car and I had the opportunity to speak at her funeral. And if it wasn't for all of that experience at network marketing, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I, I would have been terrified and I, and I just would not have been able to do it because I wouldn't have known what to say. I wouldn't have known how to say it. I, I just, I would have turned down the opportunity. And when I spoke at her funeral, the mic was acting weird and, and there was literally 2000 people in a room and I commanded that room so powerfully with so much emotion, with no mic, just speaking and just owning my truth and, and the stage. And at the end, her parents stood up and, and gave me a hug. I was the only speaker they, they stood up and gave a hug to after. And it just, I, I had people come up to me after and say, that was so powerful. And just the emotional response that I got from the audience it was all possible because of putting myself out there in that tiny little room at Aaron's house in front of three random prospects shaking and trembling with my phone. So that's kind of the story, full circle, all encompassing. That's powerful. That's awesome. And, um, you know, if you ask someone to, you know, I, I, I forget the actual line, but they said, you know, public speaking is one of the you know, biggest fears people have, you know, yep. I think it's like the second one is like being burnt alive. <laughs> the first yeah. one, public speaking. Yeah. People are yeah. more afraid to public speak than they are of literally dying. <laughs> people would rather die than public speak. And yeah. I think that just comes down to the fact that people are nervous. What are people going to think? What about this? What if that happens? What if I trip and fall? And mm -hmm. they look at all the possibilities of negative things when they could just simply look at the possibility of how powerful it is when you can command a room and invoke emotional response and get across your marketing, your messaging, whatever it is that you're trying to talk to about with the audience. Yeah. And, and I kind of want to like take a step back before you did your public speaking. Tell us about that time of when you saw, cause you obviously joined the network marketing company. So someone had to, you know, quote unquote, persuade you. And I feel like, you know, you had confidence before that, or you kind of knew who you were. There was, but there was, I know for, I know for a lot of people, uh, especially a lot of leaders, there's that one event that was like, wow, this is something that I really want to do. So did you have an experience like that? Or was there a speaker that like inspired the heck out of you um, to get you kind of down this journey? Yeah, it wasn't necessarily like one specific person, but when I joined the network marketing company, we had all these promo videos of other 18, 19, 20 year old kids speaking and just packed out houses, three-story townhomes, apartment buildings, like just in front of all these people. And they were just so confident. And it was something that I wanted. And I was like, man, if they could do it, I could do it too. And it was just the top leaders in the company. And I noticed that all of these leaders, all of these people making it and, and doing the best in the company, they were all speaking on stages. And I thought, well, if I want what they have, I have to do what they're doing and they're commanding rooms with conviction, they're standing on stages, they're influencing the masses, I need to figure it out. I have to find a way to make this happen. And then that's what kickstarted the entire journey into standing in front of those people and then just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I went. That's awesome, that's awesome. So um, that's amazing. So let's, let's kind of fast forward to where you are right now. So, because um, when you close big sales, like what's, for example, what's like the biggest sale you've, you've closed? Um, yeah. Just in business. Like, I, like, I don't know if there's a deal or maybe a bigger accolade is a month. 
Like what's kind of what's one of like your biggest accolades when, when it comes to sales and closing it? Yeah, back in 2019, I closed the deal uh, roughly with all the extra work and everything added in. It probably came out to like 665K, one deal, one handshake, one contract, um, came out to, you know, close to three quarters of a million dollars on, on one deal. Yeah, Crazy. And I, I mean, this is, <laughs> like, I know we, we laugh about it right now, but that's what public speaking does. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a type of, and you know, part of this event is to sell you on speaking more and yep. public speaking and not just like for your own ego or for your own. It's because we know it's a very high value skill. Right. Not too many people can do it. So, and you know, to even kind of, you know, look into that deal right there, a lot of people will be like, well, you know, well, that really isn't public speaking, Daniel. That's just, you know, um, someone signing a contract no, you're wrong. Let me ask you this, Austin, and we've never talked about this. Do you think there was more than one person with that deal? Did you have absolutely. to? Absolutely. Yeah. So it wasn't, you are public speaking the whole time. Why? Well, and I ended up doing public speaking because I met the owner and then I had to meet the whole board. Whole you know, board. So I had 15 people sitting in, in, in a conference room, me with my work boots on, you know, selling this room on me and my company and my business and, and us being able to perform and, and take care of them. Mm -hmm. So I have the public speak as I walk this property with the owner. And then that's kind of meeting number one. And then it turns into, I have to sell myself to the entire board. And even if I didn't have the meeting with the board, the impression that I leave on the owner, he then has to either sell me or not sell me to the board. Mm -hmm. So either way, you can influence one. People think of public speaking as like, you know, a Tony Robbins seminar, like million <laughs> people <laughs> say yes, right? Say Yes. Public speaking is with one person just as well as it is with a hundred or a hundred thousand. It all, it's the same principles and it's, it's, a, it's invoking that emotional response that you want. Mm -hmm. It's commanding them in a way that, Hey, I can, I'm, I'm the best guy to hire. I can take care of you. I can serve you. And if they don't feel that or understand that you're not going to get the contract. You're not going to get the deal. Yeah. And, and I want to add this to everyone watching this right now too. It's do you know what the best public speakers are? I don't know if you want to answer this, but it's, what do you mean it's very by the best public speakers. Well, the best, like in my, in my point of view, the best public speakers are people that can actually make, um, make their audience make decisions. Oh yeah. 100%. Like, <laughs> like there's like, you think like a great public speaker is someone who can just go up there and like, you know, get across his message and blah, blah, blah. Dude, the best public speakers are the ones that can make the room make a decision after. Yes. That's that, what that you're doing. You're influencing me. it. Go yeah, ahead. That reminds me a lot of Russell Brunson, the owner of ClickFunnels. He spoke at Grant Cardone's 10X Growth Con a couple of years ago. Yeah. And in a one hour presentation, he did like two or $3 million from the stage in sales. And it wasn't good enough that he can demonstrate his product and talk all about himself. He had to make them make a decision that this was the best product for them. This is exactly what they wanted. And then mm -hmm. they need to go up to the back of the room and actually purchase it. And right. actually give but their credit that, card, that, dude. That, yeah. yeah. So like that's, yeah, to me like that, those are the best public speakers. And I want everyone to realize this, you know, and that's why I can't wait to shift into this field, which is more sales and what sales means to you. And I know we'll kind of dive deep into like actual sales training. Um, but yeah, like that's what a good public speaker is. They can, it's, it's not just commanding a room. Like, listen to me, people, <laughs> you now, I am the speaker of the room. Yeah. You must all listen. Okay. It's that's, that's not it. What a good speaker is, is some like a, someone who knows how to command a room. It's not like I'm the speaker. I'm the guy in charge. Now listen to me. It's, right. it's, um, knowing how to build that agreement, that, um, that affinity and that, you know, you're acknowledging them and then you understand like, hey, let me show you this idea. Hey, let me tell you this uh, story or this time that happened to me. And this is where my life went. And this is why I did this. And then that's what real influence is. You get someone to make a decision. And that really all ties into commanding a room, bro. So when I hear you close a $600,000 deal or whatever it is, $700,000, you're the best of the best public speakers. You know, yeah. like, like, it, there's, like there's no conversation with that. Go ahead. And I love what you said about, you know, it's not, hey, listen to me. I'm the one on the stage. It's not an ego play of look how great I am. Like I never got into public speaking and commanding a room for an ego play or to get cool photos or inflate myself. 
It was these people are here because they need something. And I believe in the law of increase. You leave everything, every person, every situation better than you found it. So these people are in a room for a reason. I need to step on stage and own my truth and own my power and leave them better than I found them one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And for everyone listening, and I would like kind of, uh, I, you know, I kind of know my perspective, but I would love to know your perspective on this, like for someone to kind of start this journey of becoming a good public speaker. I know for myself, it's going and listening to public speakers and then getting persuaded to make decisions, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's the, that's the pattern I've learned with everyone. Well, how do I become like Austin? Well, kind of do what Austin did. You know, he should probably show up to a meeting. You probably watched the video and then you made a decision. And then it, like, so I would love to hear your perspective before we kind of get into sales, but I feel like that's the first move everyone should make become that audience first. <laughs> Yeah. And that's why the best salesmen are also the best buyers because they are decisive. They can make decisions. They're not super stingy with their money. They're willing to invest in themselves. So it's very easy to influence others to invest in themselves, right? Mm -hmm. the best salesmen are always the best buyers. And same thing is true with, with what you're saying. You know, people just really need to make a decision to put themselves out there regardless of fear. You know, everything you've ever wanted in your life, money, relationships, happiness, a better family life, whatever it is, is on the other side of fear. And at the end of the day, you either do things to gain more pleasure or you do things to move away from pain. And so many people make decisions to run from pain that they never have time to make decisions that get them closer to pleasure. Sure, there might be temporary discomfort. Sure, you might stutter on your words. I mean, I, I, my girlfriend was speaking at a big event. It's like 200 people there. And I was in the back of the room and she was talking and just completely forgot what she was saying and just laughed about it. And was like, I have no idea what, what I was talking about in the room last. And that's also an emotional response. Like it, it's just about putting yourself out there regardless of the what ifs and, oh my gosh, this could happen or that could happen. It's taking a leap. It's trusting your intuition that this is going to make you more money. It's going to make you more fulfilled. It's going to give you power and influence. It's going to help other people. And then you do it regardless of being nervous and shaking in front of a room like a leaf with your phone in your hand in front of three people like I do. That's you know? awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, let's 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 kind of get into that. How does commanding a room and sales kind of tie together? Um, because you know, like yeah, like kind of like um, because I know being a leader, it's it, this ties into really everything. And yeah, so like what does like what is sales and and how, how does it tie into commanding a room? Absolutely. So sales really is just the way I view it very simply sales is service. A lot of people think sales has a bad rep and it's, oh my gosh, salesy and sleazy. And you know, this guy tried to sell me this. If you come about sales the right way, it's simply service. Like when I sold that almost three quarters of a million dollar deal, I owned a landscape company at the time. It was a big landscape deal. They had 110 acres. This owner, his name was Fred, this owner had been through the ringer for a decade trying to keep his property maintained at a level that he was very proud of. And he couldn't find a company to do it. So all I'm doing, I'm not persuading him. I'm not selling him. I'm simply providing a service. And by commanding that sale with confidence and conviction, I'm really just giving him exactly what he wants that's genuinely going to change his life, his business, his, his property, everything. So it's really just saying sales are service. Commanding a room is service. I, I mentioned it a couple of minutes ago, but it's these people are in a room for a reason. They need something. They need closure. They need happiness. They need business acumen. They need confidence. They need to be able to speak on stages, whatever it may be. They're here for something. So when you stand up on a stage, just like when you sit in a boardroom or you go to Inca contract, that sale, that conviction is service to the prospect. Sometimes public speaking gets a bad rep when people just inflate their egos and they talk all about themselves and I'm so great and I sold this much and I did that, but they don't serve anyone. They just serve themselves hmm. and it's not helpful. People in the audience just feel worse about themselves because they see this massive disparity between here's where this individual is and I'm all the way over here and it almost leaves people worse off than you found them. But when you view it as I'm standing on this stage to serve the audience, whatever it may be. And then you come about your presentation, your confidence, your conviction out of a place of service and love for those listening. That's when lives 
start to get changed. That's when contracts start to get inked. And you just start by listening. Why is this audience here? What does Fred need? How can I serve them? And there's been many of sales calls where I've had people willing to pay me twenty or thirty thousand dollars, but they're not a good fit. They're not. I'm not the best coach for them, or sales is not the best process for them to get into right now. So out of a place of service, you don't take the money. You say, "Hey, you should go this direction," and you point them in the direction that is genuinely going to help them and benefit them. And it just comes from listening. What do they need, and how can I serve them through speaking on a stage? Or selling them through a contract or whatever it may be that you sell. Mm. And and I know you kind of like talked about this, but where do people go wrong with this? Like, say at the beginning, like if you have to talk to like your younger self, or maybe, yeah. or I'm sure you have sales reps you see that make a lot of mistakes with this. What are the main mistakes that you see in your eyes um, that are simple fixes, or you know, just fixes that need to be fixed? <laughs> yeah, they don't listen. I mean, it's exactly what I, I mentioned. They, they don't take the time to do the research and think, what is this prospect or what does this room really need? And, and I don't mean these like small little incremental changes. Like I'm talking about what's going to move the needle in the business and make long lasting impactful changes today. What do these individuals need? And that's why Russell Brunson did so well, because at 10X Growth Con, he has all of these digital and online entrepreneurs that need a platform to better sell their services with upsells and downsells and email marketing and all of these things. And when he put it all together with ClickFunnels, that's what the room needed. He took the time to do the research and listen and then build a product that made sense and then launch it in a market. I mean, it was already launched, but present it in a market that they actually needed it. And so when you go into sales or you go into public speaking, it's just listening, whether actually talking to someone and listening to their needs, salespeople get really excited. Oh, we can help this guy. He's a perfect fit. Well, how do you know you can help me when you've never asked me what I need? Are you just assuming you can help me? And then you come off as just another pushy, salesy, annoying salesperson because you want to sell everyone. I don't want to sell everyone. I want to sell the right people that I can actually help. And I can only do that by asking questioning questions, listening to responses, and then crafting the pitch, the offer, the presentation, whatever it may be, in a way that makes sense for them. Mm. Yeah, but you know, my my uh, my fl- my flip side question is, well, what if someone listens too much? Because there, there there has to be a balance of both. Because Austin, you know, you're a great speaker, man. Obviously, you know, it's easier for you to say that. But you know, I'm sure you've seen some sales guys where they all they do is listen, and then they get pushed over. Sure. Yeah, it's it's definitely <laughs> a, it's a delicate balance. You know, if you just listen and listen and listen, you end up becoming a friend or almost like a therapist. You know, and yeah, friend zoned. Yeah, people don't buy from their friends. People don't ink a three quarters of a million dollar contract with with their high school buddy. You know, or or someone they hung out with in middle school. It just doesn't typically happen. People buy from authority because they trust you. Trust is built from authority because they look at you as, okay, this guy's confident, he's convicted, he believes in his product. Like 99% of the time, people don't even know what you're saying because people don't remember what you say, but they will always remember how you make them feel. So when you just speak empty words, it doesn't mean much. But when you speak words that are behind conviction and power and belief, People probably aren't going to remember exactly what you said, but they're always going to remember how you made them feel when they sat there and they listened to that sales presentation. They sat there and listened to you stand on a stage. So it's a very delicate balance of being an authority and stepping up for people, again, out of a place of service. Not, well, you said this and you get combative and abrasive because that doesn't work either, but it's just reminding them of their truth and then bringing them to their identity. Hey, John, you told me this. But now here we are 10 minutes later and you're saying this, that's not really in alignment or in congruency of, of what you said 10 minutes ago. So help me understand. Mm. What exactly do you mean by that? And you do it in a way of asking questions rather than saying, well, John, you said this 10 minutes ago. Now you're flip-flopping. So like, are you lying or what's the deal? Like that's just friction and abrasiveness. And people are like, okay, you know, and they're, they're never going to purchase from you. People will purchase from you And you can close a deal when you sit on the same side of the table as them. And although you're authoritative, you say, let me help you. 
or help me understand so I can help you. You don't sit across the table from them in this heated sales battle. It's like, you know, some people are like, oh, you got to go to war against your prospect. It's like, good luck. Like people die in war. They, you know, you're not going to close sales trying to kill your prospect. Like it doesn't work like that. So yes, it's a delicate balance between coming off authoritative, but when you are convicted that sales are service, it's very easy to do that from a place of love. And there's been a many of calls that I didn't close or deals that I didn't ink. And I feel bad. I tell mm. them, I'm like, look, John, like I, I respect your decision. Once you've handled objections, you've gone back and forth. There kind of comes to that point where you need to pull back a little bit. And instead of selling them, they need to now go sell themselves. And I say, John, I, I respect what you're saying. I just, I feel bad because I know that I'm the best coach and this is the best process and this investment makes sense. And I know that an investment of X can turn into Y guaranteed if you put in the work. And I feel bad that you're letting these little, these little bits of fear and anxiety come over you and influence you in the wrong direction. But I respect your decision. It just breaks my heart to see you move in a direction that's in complete unalignment with where you want to be five years from now. And a lot of times people feel that genuine care for them that I literally want to serve them. And they, they always come back. They think on it for a week. They talk to their spouse. They, some people come back eight months later. Dude, you're right. And I've literally wasted the past eight months. I'm ready to rock and roll. Let's go. What do I have to do? Mm. And then you tell them your price is doubled and they have to pay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, and lose. Yeah. So um, have you taken uh, GCU? What is that? I, I, have, you, um, have you gone through Grant Cardone University? I have like not. Platform? I'm guessing- no, I have Seller Be Sold. Yeah, of is- course right here that I'm there. halfway through. I have seller be sold. I think this was free on a funnel and I, and I got two of them by accident. Um, so I need to gift one, but yeah, I haven't done anything with Grant Cardone except for seller be sold. Nice. No, you just, you just talk. I think like you, like you talk that language, right? Cause like, I've, I've been like, um, like I've, I've gone through his whole university, like, like three, four times. Oh, wow. So the 10 X rule, um, seller be sold. Be obsessed or be average. I don't know if you read those books. I've heard of them. I, uh, the only one I've read is Seller Be Sold. I'm only halfway through. So yeah, these are for everyone watching. Um, like, <clears throat> if you're wowed by what he's saying, there's a sales is and commanding a room. It's very similar. I mean, that's that's how you set a. You you can know all the words when you walk into a, a room or with a client, but if you don't know how to actually command the room and have the type of like, I'm sure everyone's listening right now and they're just like, wow, Austin is, is really um, convicted in what he's saying right now, yeah. you know? Um, I'm certain of it. I'm certain. I'm, I'm certain. I sit on a stage in Vegas and I was talking about how what got me to where I was was conviction. Like that was the word that I kept repeating because when I joined network marketing, my whole fraternity told me I was an idiot. It's a scam. It's a scheme. It's never going to work. You're never going to make any money. And so- it was me against 87 brothers of mine, fraternity brothers, right? And someone who's not convicted, which there was a bunch of people in my fraternity that joined and then got, you know, the masses told them it was a bad idea and they all quit. Well, all of those now work jobs they don't like and they're not happy. And we're talking about this was eight years ago. And that pattern of a lack of conviction has followed in their life. Mm-hmm. Now they're, they're overworked and they're underpaid. They're not satisfied with their family life or their relationships or their friendships. They're constantly unsatisfied because they don't have an unwavering conviction to get them where they want to go in the face of adversity. There's always going to be adversity. Yeah. That's the, uh, it's a type of like, um, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Cause we had a similar type of journey, right? Where you just, I think we've both dealt with so much, um, rejection at such a young age yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) you know like so many like like you had to i you know my like my mentor told me it's the elephant skin it's like your or the rhino skin your your skin's so hard like like it's like it's so funny and i think it's this really ties into commanding a room when you are just nothing can penetrate you and your beliefs um obviously that can disservice you if your beliefs are completely like you know, bad, for example. Um, but this really serves you on so many levels <laughs> when you have this, like, no one can convince me wrong. And I'm willing to walk into an, like, um, a debate and be like, okay, bro, tell me what you got. Let's hear yeah, it. 
tell me, tell me why working a nine to five job is better. Please just sure. tell me why I'm it waiting for it. Sometimes <laughs> it is better by listening. Sometimes it is better. And I think when I was younger, I had that rhino thick skin and I, everything bounced off of me and I literally could care less, but that also made me come off maybe a little douchey or abrasive where I just genuinely didn't care. Some will, some won't. So what next? Like Ooh. that was it. I'm on the phone with you. You're getting started or you're not. I don't care because I have another phone call in 30 minutes. And that probably wasn't the best approach because I was so convicted that I just didn't care about people. I cared about numbers. And as I've gotten a little older and you know that was almost a decade ago and I've matured, the elephant or the, the rhino skin has softened a little bit. And yeah. I understand I don't take things personally, but if I know that I can help you and I can't overcome your objections, I can't show you the light at the end of the tunnel and you go a different way. And I know in my heart of hearts, that's not the right direction. It hurts a little bit, but yeah. not to the point where I'm like, I quit. I can't do sales anymore. I'm not speaking on stages anymore. Nobody purchased my program. Like it's not to that point, but it's a place of service where I just have a heart where I'm like, man, I really want to help this person. What do I have to do to show them that this is the best way for them to go? Because I know what it will do for them next week, next month, 10 years from now. Yeah, you still have the rhino skin, but it's a softer rhino skin. Yeah, <laughs> I like yeah that. I'm like a baby rhino now, you know, <laughs> newborn. He hasn't hardened all the way through. He, he you know, still fits his skin, yeah. but it, it has some soft spots. But, but I guarantee if someone pushes you, it could come out again. <laughs> <laughs> we all have that in us, bro. We all have that in us. There's and, and haters and people, yeah. but like. It's, that, it's the that, response. That, I think yeah, it's the yeah. response is what you're talking about. You might've had more of like a, you, you could say a douchey response. Yeah. Now it's like, I, I actually care for you. Right. And uh, yeah, that's cool though, bro. And we, like I said yeah. earlier, some people, they should work a nine to five. They shouldn't be entrepreneurs. So like, it's just not for them and that's okay. There's, there's, and we need employees, right? You need nine to five employees to run companies and be assistants. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, exactly. Like my, my brother will be an employee, quote unquote, probably for the rest of his life. He is by far the most fulfilled and happiest person I've ever met in my entire life. Mm. And he works for someone else. And he is so satisfied. Not everyone should be an entrepreneur. A lot of people should. I think most people should, or at least be paid on performance. But by listening to people, I'm like, look, man, th this probably, this isn't for the faint of heart. I mean, this might not be the best route for you, but when, when people want it, like really, really want it, I'm like, dude, this is what you got to do. Here's the game plan. Let's rock and roll. Mm. Be convicted, stand firm in your beliefs. I mean, I was on a podcast two days ago talking about why entrepreneurs fail. And this happens, why people fail in sales, why people fail in public speaking, especially. They're like half in, half out. And they're like, you know, if I make some sales, I'll keep building the business. If not, I'll go back to my corporate job. They're like, you know, if I do really well and speak on the stage and there's no abrasiveness and it feels good and everything rolls off my tongue and I don't stutter, then I'll keep doing it. But if this is a bad experience, then I'm, I'm out. And they're half in, half out. That's like the opposite of conviction. Conviction is unwavering belief, like you're a mountain right? Like when the wind blows and it rains and hurricanes and thunderstorms, mm -hmm. the mountain is the mountain. Like it, it's unwavering. It doesn't shake. It doesn't tremble. It doesn't move. Lots of people, especially people half in, half out, they're not a mountain. They're a butterfly. They're going this way. And then the wind blows and they're over here and they're like, oh man, I got to try and course correct. And then they Girl. almost get back on track Girl. and then COVID hits. And then it's just, they're all over the place and they can never stay in a course. I think of myself as a mountain with my mm. beliefs and my conviction, not to say I can't be persuaded one way. And I don't know it all by any yeah. means. I'm always learning and growing. Yeah. But when I know this is right, or this is the right way, or this is the right method, I'm a mountain. I'm unwavering. Like good luck trying to sway me out of my convictions. You'd have to be really good. <laughs> we, we could talk for hours. eh? Yeah. We could talk for hours. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome, bro. Um, like there's, like, there's so many questions I have for you. Um, but, uh, we should definitely, 
we should definitely uh, do a podcast. If you guys, if, if, if you guys like this interview so far, I do a bonus interview, by the way, with, uh, with Austin and the All Access Pass. If you haven't upgraded yet, I don't know what you're doing, but I do a bonus interview with Austin where we'll kind of go a lot more uh, in depth in sales training um, in really what is needed to, um, you know, be a good, uh, I don't want to say salesman, but just be a good, like in my eyes, have stability in your life. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. It's like, you know, you're, we're probably both on commission or whatever the case is. Most people are on commission or entrepreneurs or salespeople. Um, but to me, it's like that was more stability than, than working a job where you're right. guaranteed a salary. Um, Cause at least if I'm performing, I can, I can call the shots on my paycheck. So right. we're going to get a lot more in depth on that idea, which is so funny. It's like the opposite of what people talk about. Commission is less stable, but yeah. in my eyes, it's actually more stable. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I have a few more questions. We have a couple minutes left. Um, I, I don't think of too much of this interview. I want to go more in depth with the other interview, but is there any last words that you kind of want to give to the audience, Austin, um, for people that want to learn how to command a room for people that want to really, um, become more convicted in who they are? Yeah, absolutely. If I could leave you with anything, it's this concept of just do it. Stop making excuses and, oh my gosh, this could happen and that could happen and the stage could break. Like people excuse their way out of everything. And then they're 50 and 60 and 80 and they never really lived a life worth living. And that's the most common thing when you chat with people on their deathbed. They wish they did more. They wish they made more. They had more love. They traveled to more countries. They did more. But we literally what if ourselves and excuse ourselves out of living a life that we're truly proud of and we're excited about. And in the moment, we act like it's not a big deal. It's like valid. Oh, well, Daniel, I'm, I'm a little nervous, man. Like, I'll get it the next time. No, you won't. You, you don't even know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. There might not be a next time. This is the right place, the right time. Do it now, regardless of the excuses. Like, there's no better feeling than doing something despite adversity, despite nervousness and feelings and lack and scarcity and whatever it may be, doing it anyway. And then you come out on the other side and you're like, oh, it wasn't that bad. And that's like when they talk about skydiving, they've put heart monitors and EKGs and things on people and their anxiety, their heart is beating the fastest right before they jump. Like when the door opens and they're on the edge of the plane, I've been skydiving. You, have you ever been? Dude, you need to go skydiving. I'll pass, bro. I'll pass. Dude, you got to go skydiving. And this is what I'm talking about. It's, it's just people, their, their, their heart rate peaks at the very top, like they're about to jump. And then as soon as they jump, the anxiety vanishes and their heart rate stabilizes and returns to normal because it's always scarier right before you do it. And then you actually do it. You actually step on that stage. You speak in that boardroom, you ink a three quarter of a million dollar deal. And you're like, oh, that was like, it that was it. And now I feel freaking incredible. Now I'm going to celebrate. And then what it does is it encourages you to do more mm. and more and more. That's why I started making a video a day for 365 days. It wasn't really for the videos. It was to hold myself accountable on a commitment. And then what did that do? It made me want to go to the gym more and then stick to that commitment and then read more and be a better person in my relationships and my friends and my family. Like it just compounds over and over, but it takes that first step of just doing it. Stop making the excuses and then it compounds and snowballs into you living a life that's like, wow, I, I did this. Like, who am I? Or who was I 10 years ago? It's, it's amazing. That's awesome. Well, everyone just do it except skydiving. We can talk about that later, but uh, <laughs> Austin, thank you so much, brother. I will see you in the next interview. And, and again, Austin Medlin, if they want to get in contact with you, Austin, where's the best place to actually reach you at? Easiest way is just on Instagram, A M E D. SS, Amen's easiest cool. way. Definitely go reach out to Austin if you have any questions on training, on mentorship, or what, or whatever the the case is. Austin has a lot of value, and uh, he's someone that can definitely help. So again, this is a thirty day speaker summit where we get the best of the best to kind of share their perspective on communication. There's so many golden nuggets for everyone watching this. My advice is watch this twice. You know, especially if you invest into the All Access Pass, where you can watch it for a lifetime. Watch these videos twice. Just because you saw it once doesn't mean you know everything yet. So I hope that makes sense. We'll see everyone in the next interview. Again, my name is Daniel Francis. I'm the host of the 30 Day Speaker Summit. We'll see you later. Take care.